Hello, Chair Kip. Hello. I'm just double checking to make sure I'm all connected. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Hello, Chair Kip. Hello, who am I speaking to?
There we go. Hello, Chair Kip. Hello, John. Glad to be glad to be back in Montana. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for sure. It was nice in there in South the uh, South Dakota. So Black Hills. How many hours did it take your wife to run the 100 miles? 29 hours and 40 minutes. So do they just start and go until they're done or do they stop? They, they yeah. do. Yeah, well, she fell asleep while she was running once. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> She's running along sleeping. <laughs> oh, brother. Yeah, that was that was that was early uh, Sunday morning. Yeah. Um, just a reminder to all the members, you are now live on YouTube. My uh, internet, my internet just went dead, so I'm back on now. <laughs> Hello, Russ. Hello. I think I saw John and Jody also. Yes. Is this Liz talking? It is. Okay, I see you down here. Hi, Liz. Good more afternoon. Good 
We got a couple minutes before we get going. <clears throat> Hope are you guys all set in your office there? Hi, Mr. Chair. Uh, we're waiting for the director. We'll be ready shortly. Okay, thank you. Just let us know. Chair Kip, we're ready when you are, sir. Okay. Um, I'd like to call this meeting of the State Parks and Rec Board to order. And we'll begin by saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I, if you have a flag there, I pledge allegiance to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first thing on our agenda today is the approval of our minutes from the June 12th meeting. Um, that was uh, the second tab in your booklet. The board members uh, all get a chance to read them. Um, are there any corrections or um, anything we need to discuss there? I move for approval of the minutes, Chair Kip. So I need a second. Second. Okay, so uh, Liz moved to approve them and Jody second them. Um, today when we vote, um, I'd like to call on each one of you and vote yes or no. Um, we've got some a couple big projects, some money projects and um, the um, language change um, that um, we'll need to vote on. So um, Jody, uh, are you yay or nay on the minutes? I am a yay, Chairman. Russ is a yay. Liz? Yay. Okay, John. Yay. And and Liz, without seeing you, just hearing you, we, we need to call um, on the vote each time. Okay. Um, so the that uh, moves forward. Um, the board member reports, and let's just start um, by by district. Uh, Jody, you want to go first? Sure. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh, what I got um, about a month ago, I did make a trip over to uh, the Flathead area. Um, it's been a while since I've been to Summers Beach and then also wanted to visit some parks down the east side, down the east shore. Um, so Summers Beach, um, I'll start there. That was, um, it was nice to see Summers Beach. I did send um, some photos that I took to the board and I hope everybody got a chance to see those. I know that um, that the chairman and, and board member Liz, that you guys have been to the beach and seen it. So there's been quite a bit of improvement since we've been there. Um, we saw it in early spring after the dynamic beach was constructed. And it was kind of neat looking at the pictures. You can see how it's just kind of filled in and, and looks much more natural now than it did at the time. 
Um, and so it was kind of just nice to see that. It's nice to see the improvements to the parking area that was there. Um, and while I was there, it was a very nice day and it was pretty busy. There was probably 15 to 20 cars in the parking lot. I saw um, little kids with moms and, and teenagers on bikes. I saw a elderly woman that could get down to the beach with her, uh, her little walking assisted her, her um, you know, the, like the stroller kind of thing that, that they use to help instead of a cane. And so it was just nice to see all the different uses and people there enjoying it. Um, so it's come along nicely. It was a great day. Um, the, uh, like one thing that, uh, that I think you'd find interesting is that our last meeting, we approved a pretty good chunk of money for Summers Beach. And part of that's going to be spent on the uh, enhancement to the beach. And so I, one thing that is going to be nice about that is um, it's the material that's going to be put on the beach is going to be much smaller, kind of, of a um, rather than, you know, what we see there now is there a lot of erosion control. And when you get that smaller stuff in there, it's going to be kind of the material that's there. It's kind of be, be more friendly for being on the beach, sitting on the beach, easier to walk on. It's, it's kind of a challenge right now, just getting down the beach because the rocks are pretty large. So it's going to be real nice in addition to, of course, the additional erosion control that that would provide. So um, that was great. Um, after that, we went down and went by all oh, wayfarers and just just kind of took a quick look at the park um, through Yellow Bay and, and that because I had never been to either of those um, before and then um, ended at Finley Point. And if you um, remember, there's a possibility of some cabins or yurts that would be added to Summers Beach. Well, recently they also added a couple of those same cabins. I think they would be nearly identical. Um, so there's a couple of those cabins that have been added recently um, to Finley Point. I think they were just added in last fall and I'd never seen those. So one of the, one of the cabins was empty. So we were able to kind of, I say we, it was me and my wife and my dog. So um, we got a chance to go in and, and take a look at this cabin and, and that was vacant and they're, they're real nice. So um, it's looking good. The, um, I believe that there's going to be um, some improvements to Yellow Bay coming up in the future um, and entrance improvements and some other things there. And um, one thing that I noticed wasn't <clears throat> kind of, Oh, the one thing that's that's an issue with Flathead right now is the the water level in the lake is so low. The people have got their people got their boats out. Um, you know they have most people there have their docks are fixed. They're so used to being a full pool, and now um, you can't even use the so many of the docks that are there. We've got some docks or some boat slips at Finley Point, and they were empty because people just can't have their boat there. So that's something to consider. Um, some of these things as we look at um, here later today, I think are a result of this low water condition. So, so that's all I have, Mr. Chairman. And if anybody has any questions on, on that area, I'll be, do my best. Okay. Thank you, uh, Jody. Um, I'll go next, District 2. Um, my report is <clears throat> be about Bannock days, and and I invited uh, the the board members to come down to Bannock days, and um, Jody and John both came down, um, and uh, we spent the morning at uh, Bannock days, had breakfast. Um, it's put on by the Bannock Association. It's a fundraiser for them, and they put a lot of money and effort into Bannock, um, and it was fun to to take them around and show them the different parts of Bannock, how neat they were. The uh, original Masonic temple is above the uh, schoolhouse. And um, it's one of the few days that it's open to the public and you can go in and they'll uh, talk to you about that. Um, they had a, a gunfight in the street, um, lots of food, uh, just a great time talking with uh, John Phillips the uh, ranger, the manager at, um, at Bannock, he said that they had 
um, over 5,000 people come in those two days. And um, that's not as big as it used to be. Um, <clears throat> Pre-pandemic, I think the record was close to 7,000, but a 5,000 plus attendance is great. Um, a special thanks needs to go to the ranch that's just uh, at the entrance to Bannock because they allow parking um, in their fields and in their, um, basically their barnyard and their entry into their, their ranch. And without that additional parking, it'd be very difficult to um, put Bannock days on. But it was great. It was great to have a couple of the um, board members come down and, and see um, my home park. So that's really all I've got for uh, my report. Um, Liz, uh, you're up next. Thank you, Chair Kip. A um, couple of things going on in my region. The First Peoples Buffalo Jump State Park is in some development planning for future development and enhancements at that site. Um, they've had an information meeting, a public scoping survey. Um, they're also working with the tribal liaison. Um, so, and then, oh, they even had an in-person workshop in conjunction with the park's annual mammoth hunt event. So that was pretty, they got some pretty good responses from that. So next steps will be to work with the tribal partners and then develop a cultural survey of the areas where the developments might happen. Uh, Black Sandy State Park, they also have had some erosion control issues over there. So a project was approved last year. The project is about 90% complete. They just need to install a fence around the project. And they did have to close a couple tent sites just to help the grass reestablish in those areas. And Black Sandy has been super busy. The recreation manager, Sue Matthews and her husband, Larry, campground hosts have been doing an excellent job out there. Over at Ackley Lake, Ackley Lake State Park, um, FWP purchased and installed some buoys and a rope for a boat exclusion area. There's only one dock over there and it's just difficult with boaters trying to get in and out with their trailers and having swimmers near the area. So the Ackley Lake Club actually applied for and received a grant from the Central Montana Foundation along with some donations from private individuals and the Lewistown Area Walleyes Unlimited. And so they purchased the dock and donated it to FWP and it uh, was installed in late June. So that's a great addition to that area. And my other state park is Giant Springs. They had another successful junior ranger program and they also started back up with the trivia in the park. And it actually continues every Tuesday night to the end of September. And we have a new recreation manager there, Stefan, and I'm gonna mess up the last name, Janicula, I believe. <laughs> so that's what's going on in my region. Right, thank you, um, Member Whiting. Um, John, hey, you're up next, District 5. Yeah, um, enjoyed uh, Bannock State Park. That was a, that was a very good, uh, very nice morning. Um, and I met the regional, uh, my regional geologist and uh, the biologist there. Had some good discussions with them and uh, talked with uh, Mike Ruggles. Um, and we're, we're setting up a meeting with Region 5 and Region 7 uh, to get together and, uh, and find out what their issues are um, there. Um, but yeah, the Ban Bannock State Park is, a, is a, an amazing place, amazing history and uh, um, uh, just they put on a great, great, uh, a great thing there for Bannock days. Appreciate it, uh, Russ. And that that's it for for me. Okay, um, 
when you were talking about uh, Tom, you you said um, uh, District Seven that that's the no uh, region Wildlife and Parks District. Yeah, well, yeah, I'll yeah, I, I got more information about that from Mike. So uh, those are the regions that encompass District Five of the parks. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, um, that's it for our uh, board member reports. The next is the director report. Uh, Dustin, are you ready? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I also attended Bannock Days this year and just wanted to recognize the terrific job that our staff and the community does in putting that on. Lots of folks there, everybody was having a good time. Um, kudos certainly to Parks and Outdoor Rec for organization, but I want to just acknowledge there's a ton of staff participation beyond the Parks Division. Uh, law enforcement, wildlife, or design and construction folks were there. There's a bunch. This is a really an agency event, and I think showcases well the fact that Fish, Wildlife, and Parks is, is a, a very, very high-functioning team, um, and it doesn't really matter what you do in the agency. We all pull together to support the state and what we do so very well very well done um, on behalf of uh, not just parks and outdoor rec but the agency at large um, the day of honors coming up at chief plenicu state park um, on september 2nd this is the 28th year for that event and the theme this year is restoration of heritage to complement to complement the work that's getting underway to preserve um, the chief's house. And this is a big deal for us and the Crow Nation. Um, so if you get a chance, um, find your way to Plenty Coos State Park there south of Billings. We've had some, some projects completed recently that are really exciting. We've had these, um, these action track chairs installed at Lone Pine State Park and Lake Elmo. That is Thanks uh, in no small part to the State Parks Foundation, the Christopher Reeves Foundation, and a grant from Hydroflask. Um, those have been really well received. The governor attended the event at Lake Elmo. He was really impressed with those. And then the Frenchtown Pond uh, and All Abilities Kayak Launch is now complete. And I've had a couple of calls on that in particular, and everybody who sees that is really, really impressed. So again, thank you to those folks and to Parks and Outdoor Rec for getting those things completed. Campsite reservations, number of things on that front. You know, we've long been in an arrangement with Idaho um, to use their reservation provider. Um, they are going to be switching, not going to be able to contract with the one they have any longer. So we'll be looking for um, a replacement for that capacity for the 2025 season, and it will integrate with the department's Explore Montana uh, technology initiative that um, we've been working on for several years. Uh, some other changes uh, coming next year in response to House Bill 440 to create more camping opportunity for residents is no more than 80% of our campsites now will be able to be reserved. Uh, we've shortened the reservation window from six months to three months. So think February instead of November. And then we're considering reducing the maximum night stay from 14 nights to seven nights. We heard a lot about preserving resident opportunity across all spectrums of outdoor recreation during the session, something the legislature took some action on both in terms of hunting and you'll see it here in, in campsites. So something we need to be mindful of. Um, the yurt at Makoshka State Park, which has been long in the making, has been constructed. Uh, thanks again to the State Parks Foundation. We are very fortunate in this state to have such an active um, State Parks Foundation. The Fish Creek Recreation Management Strategy draft is getting close to being available for public comment. Look for that next month. You've already heard um, from Member Whiting about um, potential developments at First Peoples Buffalo Jump. And then the legislature appropriated, I want to say it's $2 million or $2.5 million or something like that for um, a new state park in Miles City, when that is the old BNSF train depot. So um, that project is moving along. The county is in negotiations with BNSF. There's been a draft agreement to transfer that property from BNSF. Um, our lands programs looked at it, sent it back. So hopefully we will see that transfer soon and 
scoping and outreach and site plans being developed to um, establish a visitor center at that really, really neat building there in Mile City. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. So next on the agenda today are action items. Um, the uh, parks and outdoor rec capital projects exceeding $50,000. Um, uh, Hope Stockwell, Division Administrator of Parks and Outdoor Rec Division, will be the presenter. Um, I guess uh, your turn, Hope. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, members. Uh, for the record, Hope Stockwell, Administrator of the Parks and Outdoor Recreation Division here at FWP. And the first item in front of you today is a review and approval of state park capital projects that exceed $50,000. The board is required to approve construction projects that have an estimated cost of more than that amount. You see that list of items in front of you. They're in various stages of progress, but your approval today um, to approve expenditures over $50,000 will help us keep those moving in their various stages as uh, efficiently and quickly as possible. Uh, happy to answer any questions, Mr. Chair. A um, couple new ones here. The uh, the signage and way, way finding updates. Um, can you just give us a few details of some of these going down the list? Certainly, Mr. Chair. The signage and wayfinding uh, appropriation from the 2023 legislature totaled 1.25 million. This is a good one for clarification. Not all 1.25 million will be expended in state parks. It's a total amount for sign replacements at our sites across the state of all types. Uh, we're still working on finalizing uh, the prioritization of sign replacement. The intention is that this will be a phased process over this biennium and perhaps next biennium as well, uh, looking to update our wayfinding and signage along highways, also within our sites. It's really about better identifying our properties for public awareness, um, but also for safety and direction, and then visitor information to improve their user experience. Again, not all 1.25 million will happen in state parks, but we can't tell you right now exactly how it will break down between say, state parks and fishing access sites and wildlife management areas. So we're asking for the approval on the full so we don't have to come back and piecemeal this with you. We can just roll out once we have the prioritization set. Okay. Um, third on the list is the um, Mile City Train Depot renovation and um, director um, talked about that. So then next thing, um, the Beaver Hill Comfort Station, um, just a brief description. Certainly. I'm very intimately familiar with the Beaver Tail Hill Comfort Station. It's one of my favorite places to camp near the Kettle House Amphitheater in Missoula. I personally recommend campsites 7 and 22. Um, however, I don't, I don't really recommend the bathroom facilities. They're old. They just need updated. This site is used frequently by interstate users. Um, it, it just gets a ton of use, and, and we need more also to make it ADA friendly. Okay, um, and then down on the bottom, the Wayfair boat ramp extension, um, is this a little something that Jody alluded to, the lake being lower and we're needing to, to do some work there? Mr. Chairman, it's actually work that preceded the low levels this summer. This is just work to improve the boat ramp that was already needed. It did not contemplate the low pool effects. Okay. Um, any other questions from the uh, uh, directors, board members? Okay, um, I think we're all good there, and I'll need a I'll need a motion for that. Mr. Chairman, go ahead. I move the State Parks and Recreation Board approve the expenditures by the department on the listed construction projects of more than $50,000. Okay, Jody made the motion. We need a second. This is Liz. I second it. Okay, and Liz seconds that. Um, do we have uh, any public commenters today? 
online commenters? No. None. No. None? Okay. Uh, then uh, we'll vote on that motion to approve that. Um, uh, Jody? A yay or nay? I vote yay. Okay. Uh, District 2 is Russ, and that's a yay. Uh, District 3 is Liz. Aye. Yay. And, and District 5 is John. John, you're, you're muted. Your mic is muted. Yay. Yay. Okay. So Yay. all four of the um, board members approve that. So the next thing on our agenda is um, consolidated public use rules, arm rules for land administered by the FWP. Uh, Hope will be the presenter again. Um, if you'll go ahead, Hope. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Again, for the record, Hope Stockwell, Administrator of the Parks and Outdoor Recreation Division. This item is uh, moving forward in the second step of the rulemaking process for bringing forward a consolidated public use rule set for all lands administered by FWP. We've been talking about this in various stages for months and even years. It's been in progress. I want to thank today uh, Phil Kilbreth and Charlie Sperry who are in the room today and then also Rick Northrup from the Wildlife Division, uh, Lauren Flynn in Parks and Outdoor Recreation and Jamie McNaughton in our legal unit who most recently have had their fingerprints on finalizing this proposal to go forward. It reflects the governor's red tape initiative and the purpose is to consolidate again so that we can consistently manage between our various site types uh, makes it easier for us, but also makes it easier for the public to comply. The rules have an eye toward flexibility so that if we need site-specific differences, um, we can continue to have that management flexibility, say for something that's different at a wildlife management area than a state park. The rules allow for that. Um, I do want to say that the Fish and Wildlife Commission reviewed the rule set last week and moved it forward. The step today is seeking your approval to instruct us to file the administrative rule notice with the Secretary of State so that this would go th through the Montana administrative procedures process and public comment and hearing. Uh, it would come back to you at a later future meeting for review of the public comments received and the department's response and whether any modifications would be proposed at that time. Uh, but for now, Mr. Chair, I'll stand aside for questions. Okay. Um... I've got um, a couple of questions and you kind of answered one there for me. Um, we have 39 rules that we're going to um, um, repeal and we have 24 rules. And um, so looking through some of them, um, the question, and you said that um, they could um, have an exception to the rule or otherwise um, some authorization to do something besides just what these rules say, is that correct? Mr. Chair and members, in some cases, there are specific differences in the rule. For instance, group use permits at a, a wildlife management area are required for over 10 people, but at a state park, it's over 30 people. So there are some differences specified in the proposed rule, but then there's also flexibility in the language to say that unless otherwise posted by the department, you would be deferring that authority to the department to state something differently for a site based on its specific conditions either due to wildlife use of the site or specific environmental conditions there. You'll see that language in various places throughout this. So the department has the flexibility to, fo to post something more specific for that site than what these rules say based on those conditions. Okay, they, they talk about an eight, eight people for a max at a campsite, but on the Smith, the maximum group size is 15. So that would be one of those exceptions. Right, that could be one of those situations where unless otherwise posted by the department. Okay. Um, any other questions from board members?
Sorry. Um, Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, so the um, Hope, what are the three sets of rules that these replace? Mr. Chair and Member Loomis, so we're consolidating rules that previously applied separately to state parks, to wildlife management areas, and to fishing access sites. Okay. Um, and does, so the board has authority over rulemaking, over rules, is that, is policy different than rules? It is. Um, Mr. Chair and Member Loomis, and the specific board authority that you have is um, rulemaking for state parks. There are different policy processes that I would defer to our legal unit to to explain. Okay, and so what we're looking at is the is a rule change, and then the um, where let's say maybe a rule is changed, but there needs to be some refinement on. Uh, at, a, at a specific site, then that would take department policy to correct that? Is that? Am I saying that? Do I understand that right? Mr. Chair and Member Lewis, honestly, the way that we would do that, practically speaking, is we would leave that authority with the regions and, and the regional supervisors and site-specific managers to determine um, if there was something that was higher profile you know, we would coordinate with them on that as needed. But for local decision making, we want to give them that flexibility for their site management. Okay. Um, so, um, so some in some of these cases, when I look at this and I'm and I'm looking at the rules, um, well, let me back up a little bit. So, what we're going to vote on today is one. Is we're going to in initiate the process with the Secretary of State, the MAPA process, and what we send forward here is basically we're agreeing to the specific set of rules. We're we're going to vote to say that this board supports these rules and without change, and that's what. Am I correct? We are sending these rules forward. Member Loomis, you're. You're sent. This is the you're approving the draft to drop into the MAPA process. So this this initiates that process. So you're approving that this draft rules is what's going to get filed with the Secretary of State, and that kicks off a public comment process to include a hearing. You'll get the results. All of the comments that come in on these rules will come back to you unfiltered, um, and then the board will decide based on those comments if they want to approve this or they want to make changes. So this is not your last bite at the apple. Right, right, okay. Um, but it's still, as it, if I look at, at these rules and I'm not real clear on something or if I, I don't feel real comfortable with something, um, this, is, this is the spot where we address it. Member Loomis, if I might, I think I'm gonna have uh, Chief Legal Counsel Clergate just kind of walk you through what your options are. Board member Loomis chair, this is Sarah Clergate and I am the new chief legal as the director said, and he succinctly stated where we are in the process now. At this time, you can redline these rules as they relate to parks, specifically because that's your authority as um, Ms. Stockwell pointed out. Um, the portion of the rules that relate to the Fish and Wildlife Commission that, that lay in their house, um, those you can't change. If you would like to redline the parks portions of the rules before they are published, you are free to do that now, or you can wait until after you get public comment and redline them at that point based on the public comment. If the changes at that point after the public comment have come in are substantial, um, which is a judgment call that I will help you make, um, then at that point they will go back out for public comment again, if there are substantial changes, or if you just want to redline what I would call procedural things, uh, then they don't have to go back out for a second public comment round. They can be adopted at that point. So you have two places where you can redline, if that makes sense. Okay. <clears throat> um, so if I understand it, the 
other three documents, the other three sets of rules that we look at, those will those be null and void? In other words, that we've got the this one new set of rules and the and the the other three um, or the other two that are you know that we've drawn from, those are no longer in effect. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Member Loomis, um, I think I'm going to let Sarah answer that too. Um, the, the, the ones that are marked as repealed, sorry, Chair and Board Member, those will be repealed and replaced with these rules. So if those are if the ones that are marked repealed are the ones that you're referring to, then the answer to your question is yes. Okay. Um, I guess the reason I'm asking these questions is because I see, um, excuse me, Mr. Chair. Um, I see uh, some new rules that it seems like as we look at the different rules that are there that affect a certain a certain use, I see what is becoming the more overarching rule seems to be the more restrictive version of that. And then, so what we would need is a policy to come in place to, if we were to bring that back to what was originally intended um, and what activities were allowed, um, if we were gonna bring it back to what it was originally, it would take some policies in place to do that. Um, and so we kind of have an attitude or it looks at things as like maybe things are uh, like on recreation, um, things are more, seem to be more open at, and then now what we, we sign what would be closed and the change would be things are closed and they're going to have to be special notices to show that certain areas are open. And a lot of what I refer to is uh, what the commission rules are currently for uh, the wildlife management areas. Um, in that area, if we were to look at specific rules for um, snowmobile use in the wildlife management areas, um, it does a very good job of outlining what uses are um, uh, acceptable, what uses are open. And this document now, um, which specifically lines out what uses are available um, in the wildlife management areas, whether it be on the groomed route or what areas are open, now we've replaced that with a rule that just says it's uh, that the area is closed except for designated areas. So um, designated areas open to snowmobiling, for instance. Then what I, and now that puts us in a position where everything that would, if we were, would still be open to, um, if we were gonna bring it back to the current use, what is open now, it's gonna take a lot of policy and signage to make that happen the way I, I see that. Do I understand that correctly? Chair Kip, may I jump in? Please. So someone, someone with more information than me, stop me if you, if I misspeak. This is how I understand how arms work and why these, why this agenda item is important. So, and I could be misreading this, but if we have policy and arms in place regarding a wildlife management area in one part of the state, we don't necessarily have the exact same policy and plan in a different part of the state. And same with any other types of special use areas. So FWP has to rely on each individual space and change the policy and go through the whole arm process, which is horribly tedious and time consuming to make any kind of little adjustment to try to make all of the different use areas follow the same policies. What this allows is a uniformity and uniform and consolidated policy across the state for all these different areas. And what they said is the exception is if you're in, you know, pick a state park, Giant Springs, and 
that's a terrible example, but you know, we pick a state park. And if at that specific state park, we have different allowances for nights camping or different allowances for use that can be posted and modified just for that one area, but all the other arms and policy would be standardized. So this is actually helping FWP considerably and it's helping the public because the same policies apply to the same use areas across the state. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Mr. Chairman, um, I think that's I think that's well said. Um, you know, in addition, you know, I mean, it, there's the goal here is that there's a set of circumstances that are addressed in administrative rule that are common to all site types. So examples, the prohibition on Tannerite use, it was common across all FWP administered land that was found in three separate rules. And so we can address circumstances like that in a single consolidated rule set. So there's one administrative record place for people to go look as it relates to the specific example, um, Mr. Chairman, that, that member Loomis is talking about. Um, I don't know if he's referring to a specific WMA or a potential a different biennial rule. In either case, it's wildlife management area specific and at those rules belong to the commission. Mr. Chairman, um, it was just, that's the rules that the um, director is referring to uh, that belong to the commission. That was one of my concerns is that those, that those rules is one of the sets of rules that would be replaced by these rules that we have before us today. Mr. Chairman, Member Loomis, you're correct. And the, the commission, um, I believe, weighed that out um, as they advanced this rule set last Thursday at their meeting. So they, they, have, they have been through this as well for their piece um, and have, have uh, instructed us to move this forward uh, into the MAPA process. But you're right in that those rules that were specific to WMAs, specific to fishing access sites, and then it, with, if you were to approve this today, you know, at the conclusion of this process, those rules would be repealed and replaced with whatever versions the board and the commission chose to approve after digesting whatever public comment comes to you during the MAPA process. Okay, yeah, um, I understand and, and thank you for that. I guess my concern is that when you've got some detail on specific uses that the public has, and, and I just referred to um, the snowmobiling in the WMAs, was one because it specifically talks about four different areas that in in great detail of um, what uses what time of the year and and it is it's locked in you know so i know i have that access in these areas and then that's being replaced with a statement that says snowmobiling is being allowed in areas designated open to snowmobiling on only open designated areas and so there's nothing, there's no wording, there's no text that says these areas are going to remain open. It's just kind of leaving it out to say you can only ride in open areas and we'll, we'll let you know later what those areas are. So I, I kind of find myself going through the document um, that's proposed here for us today, looking for changes that that I'm concerned about and I and it's it's overwhelming I'm I'm looking and saying well does is this rule change and I see some rules that are being put in place or, the, or should I say the wording on the rules that's proposed is the more restricted version of of that even with even with pets on leashes I mean we've we even that one I, I'm like we have the most, the one that gets printed is the most restrictive. Dog's got to be on an eight foot leash. Um, and instead of, and so that if you are looking at taking your pet in a wildlife management area or something remote like that, there's going to, the way I interpret, there's going to be a special rule in place that, that would be targeted to a certain area that lets you get your dog on something longer than eight feet. So, it's it's kind of like the most restrictive version of that particular rule is put into place. And I found the same thing with dispersed camping. Um, we have dispersed camping that's 
in place now that this rule would now make um, a, an infraction um, unless unless it was you know an, an amended or this kind of thing. So it's it's a big job for me to go through uh, all of these rules and try to decipher what is an actual change and then say, oh well, the department is going to post um, uh, policies on site to correct that change that doesn't apply to this particular area. I would rather see the, um, the overarching arching rule that would be proposed to be um, the less restrictive and then whatever additional management tools need to be put in place at a specific site like a fishing access site or a more congested area, that that be increased above and beyond, um, my opinion. Mr. Chairman, Member Loomis, just a couple of comments. So there, regardless of, of how this turns out, there's, there are seasonal rules for wildlife management areas that address specifically the snowmobiling issue that have been in place and will continue to remain in place. So there will be another, another rule that addresses that. And, you know, I just wanted to make a comment, um, Mr. Chair and Member Loomis, in response to the dispersed camping issue. Um, as we see more and more recreation pressure on the landscape, you know, um, for years that was accommodated largely without concern on a whole bunch of our properties, mostly wildlife management areas where you see that. There are enough people recreating now that there's real harm coming to those areas. Those areas are all federally encumbered for a very specific purpose. That's a wildlife management purpose and any other use to that has to be compatible. So as we look to deal with dispersed camping, particularly on wildlife management areas, we're compelled by our obligations, uh, both to the agency's mission and to the funding sources we use to acquire those properties to make sure that those impacts are, are not of sufficient magnitude to disrupt the purpose of those properties. So you know, our, our position here on that is, is to be conservative, to make sure that we are first protecting the resource and, and then going to opportunity for others. So that's just a bit of context on the dispersed camping issue. Uh, certainly not to discount anything you've said, Member Loomis. Uh, there is a lot of material here for sure. Mr. Chairman. Um, Member Loomis, have you got any more there? Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, um, Director Temple, for that the comment. And my thought was that the, the goal of the document mostly was consolidation, get rid of redundancy, make things easier to understand, and not get into addressing whether we should change a particular rule for a certain reason. Um, and when you talk about dispersed camping, and what I hear is that we're looking at at the same time, we're also going to make adjustments on what we think should happen with dispersed camping. I think that should be separated out and changes to rules should be addressed at a different time or separately than just consolidation. This is like a great big um, one great big project that's doing a whole bunch of different things at the same time. I, I would think that streamlining uh, consolidation, reducing red tape, but the governor's initiative to do that to make things more simplified is perfect. But when we're actually changing rules and what uh, type of types of uses are available in a particular area at this time, and that's going to change, and that is going to change, I think that needs to be stepped back and should be taken another look at. I think that should be two different two different things. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Chair. Chair. Um, is that, uh... Liz. Liz, there you are. Go ahead, Liz. Um, so just one comment, Mr. Chair and members. Um, so I think it's really tricky for us to understand the complexity of the MAPA and the ARM process. Um, and I don't know, maybe, maybe member Loomis, you have experience in going through an ARM process. I have had to, um, and it is a several month or years long process. So I am 
wholeheartedly in favor of moving this forward because moving this forward doesn't mean that exactly what we read is exactly how it's gonna be. The ARM process involves public comment and more hearings before it even goes anywhere. <laughs> so I'm in favor of this proposal and I'm gonna move that the State Parks and Rec Board instruct the department to file an administrative rule notice on behalf of the board proposing a consolidated set of public rules for all land types administered by FWP. Um, I want to hear, um, make sure that we have all of our comments in before we have that. Um, Sorry. Motion, please. Um, John, have you got uh, any comments here? Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, Member Loomis. Um, it seems like it it gives the state uh, almost too much power, really, um, the way it is. But uh, I also agree with Liz that this is just the beginning of the of the process. So um, it probably is a, a good idea to to further the process. Okay, thank you, uh, John. It, it looks like uh, as the process goes along, uh, there'll, there'll be plenty of comment. And um, I would guess, uh, Jody, that that public process is gonna flush out a lot more um, detail about each little item than, than the few things that we found looking at it. Um, so, I, I guess I'm in favor of it moving forward. Uh, if we, if we're done with our discussion, if we need any more, we'll have it. If not, then um, we'll go back to Liz for a motion. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. But just, just finally, I guess my vote is my vote would be saying that I approve. I, I approve of the process. I approve of looking. And I approve it all of the comments and evaluation as much as we can look at this dom document and pick it apart and, and and I welcome all comment I think it's awesome um, but the reason I wouldn't support is because my my vote is saying that I agree with this list of rules which I'm I don't know well enough I see some things that cause me to say I need more time to look at this and I have more questions. So that's it. If I could, you know, if so, understand that I'm not against consolidation, but this particular set of rules, I, I don't even understand it enough to, um, and the, and the implications or possible unintended consequences. If this was to go forward in this, in this form, that's why I don't support this. It's just this particular set of rules. I, Anyway, back to you. Looks like his internet cut out. Did we lose the chair? I yeah, believe so. The chair. We did, he did earlier also. Yeah. He was having problems with his internet before. Members, if you want to stand by for just a minute, we'll see if we can get him back.
All right. Okay, I'm back on. I'm going to hang up the phone. Yeah. Okay, we I uh, keep freezing up on my uh, screen, so um, Director Temple has an idea. If if you all could turn your cameras off when you're not speaking, that will lower the amount of information that has to go to Chair Kip over his connection, and maybe we can stabilize that. Okay. Um, Jody, you were just finishing up a thought when I, when you, when I lost you. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Basically, all I was just trying to say is that I support, um, all of, all the comments, uh, that we could get on, on these new rules, um, all the input I've been pouring over it, trying to learn it and understand it, comparing it to other rules of the past. And it's just, I'm just not convinced that, that I'm ready to support this set of rules um, at this time. It's just too much. So I, that's, that's basically it. Okay, um, I think we're back to Liz. Do you wanna make your motion again, Liz? Sure. I move the State Parks and Recreation Board instruct the department to file an administrative rule notice on behalf of the board proposing a consolidated set of public use rules for all land types administered by FWP. Okay, do I have a second on that? Mr. Chairman, I second that. Okay, John seconds that. Um, do we have any um, online commenters for this? No, Mr. Chairman. Okay, then I'll call for a vote on this. Um, Jody, uh, District 1, you're first. No. Jody is a no. Uh, Russ is a yay. Um, Liz? Yes. And John? Yay. Okay, the uh, motion passes uh, three to one. And I'm just going to say it looks like we're going to have some opportunity to, um, you know, look at all the comments and 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 alter some things through this process. So uh, next thing on the agenda is the Smith River Bonus Point System Administrative Rulemaking Initiation. Um, Hope is the presenter again. Uh, Hope, do you want to? Go forward there. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hope Stockwell, Administrator of the Parks and Outdoor Recreation Division. Your last item today is the Smith River Bonus Point System Administrative Rulemaking Initiation. As you'll recall, House Bill 846 in the 2023 legislative session required the board to adopt rules for a bonus point system for residents and non-residents. And that uh, bill also stipulated that the number of Smith permits that can be purchased by non-residents is limited, or rather I should say may not exceed 10% of the available permits. So the proposal in front of you today is um, reflective of that. This proposal was put together uh, having taken input from the bill's sponsor, Representative Tom France, as required by statute. And he really desired that this mimic the hunting bonus point system. And that is what staff has endeavored to do um, between the Parks and Outdoor Recreation staff, our licensing unit staff, as well as the regional staff in Region 4 and our legal unit. There's been a lot of folks working on this including our IT folks. We appreciate everyone's efforts to keep this moving. It needs to be implemented for the next application cycle, which opens early in 2024. Um, but Mr. Chairman, I think I'll stop there um, and ask for questions and how you'd like to proceed. Okay, thank you, um, Hope. Um, any questions from the board members? No, no questions. I guess I have uh, one. Um, we're, we're, um, this bonus point system is uh, similar to the um, 
hunting bonus point systems. So is this available for a resident to, to purchase a bonus point? Mr. Chairman and members, yes, this would allow residents and non-residents to purchase. The fee for residents would be $5 pursuant to House Bill 846, and the fee for non-residents would be $50. And they could purchase one per year. They would have the opportunity to purchase while they were applying for their Smith River permit. Or if they chose not to apply for a Smith River permit in any given year, they could still purchase a, a bonus point later between July 1st and September 30th of the year, which also mimics the hunting bonus point system. Okay, and the hunting system, uh, you can only build up a certain amount of points and then uh, you can't build them. Could you build uh, more points as a resident, say, I really wanted to go in five years and I wanted this would buy bonus points to, to move me up. Well, that's right. Well, they can accumulate until they're successful. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, the preference points for non-residents have the limit on accumulation. Bonus points do not have a limit in the hunting system, nor would they in this system. You're correct. Thank you. I was wrong there. Okay, that's um, any other questions from board members? Mr. Chairman, we do have a clarification to the rule language from legal counsel, if you would indulge us for a minute. Please. Chair, this is Sarah Clergate again for the record. And we have in the intervening time between when this was the draft of these rules were posted to you. And now there have been a couple of points raised just for clarity, and I would call them procedural, but I wanted to walk you through them um, because it would be a change to what would be published with the Secretary of State, a change from what's in front of you. And I'll just walk through, there's only a couple of them. And as I said, they're very procedural. So if, with your indulgence, I'll just walk through them very quickly. Okay, thank you. So, the change to new rule one, which appears on the second page of the packet that you have of the rules in subsection five, we would be adding after the statute, it says MCA section 232408. We're just adding one B, which is the subsection of the statute that is necessary to implement this rule. And so that's one of the changes. And I can stand for questions on each of these or I can go through them and then stand for questions at the end at your pleasure, Chair. Um, just go through them all, please. Okay. And then moving down in the same rule to subsection 10, rather than saying subject to five above, we're going to insert the statutory site again as above. Montana Code Annotated 23-2408, subsection 1B. So that would just be a, a further clarification there of a reference back to the statute. And then the same change would occur in subsection 11, where we just change rather than a cite back to subsection 5 above, we're citing to the actual statute that's that we're required to implement through this rule. And then... Finally, in new rule two, which is on the third page of your packet, this is an attempt to clarify how the lottery will be done based on some questions we received. In subsection four of new rule two, we would be adding the words during the lottery so that the entire subsection four will read, the department may only apply accumulated bonus points to a person's chance to obtain a Smith River permit during the lottery if the person per purchases a bonus point when applying for the permit. So just the addition of the three words during the lottery in that subsection four of new rule two. And then in subsection five, we would add um, the word mathematically before square. So it will read the department shall mathematically square the, the number of bonus points a person has accumulated when conducting. And then instead of saying the drawing, we will say the lottery for Smith River permits. And again, those are just attempts to clarify exactly how this is gonna work. 
and square them with our, pun intended, with our um, licensing language in the statute. So those are the only changes that we would propose to make from what is in front of you before we publish to the Secretary of State. So I ask that when you make your motion today, if you move forward with the um, motion to move these to the Secretary of State's process, that it would include those changes that I've just outlined. Okay, that, those sound good to me. Um, any, uh, any questions from board members? Mr. Chair, this is Liz. Okay, Liz. So I don't necessarily have a question, but I think this is, as I understand the ARM process, if we move this motion forward, which I recommend we do, again, it's saying that we approve the department to start the ARM notice. So I guess I feel like it's my job as a board member to let the public weigh in on what FWP is proposing and let the public help guide and shape these rules. So I am in favor of it and I will I'll let someone else speak. <laughs> okay. um, any other comments from board members? Um, Mr. Chairman, this is Jody. Okay. Um, I, we did get, if I understand it, there was a public comment period for this already. Is that right? And then, um, was there, was there public comment that was received? We, we um, need to, we need to make the motion and, um, then, then we'll have, uh, online comment or, oh, well, written public comment. That's uh, your uh, question. Okay. Uh, uh, help us here. Do we have a uh, written public comment that you received? Chairman, um, members, this is Sarah Clergett again for the record. And we have not received public comment on this yet because it will go forward to the. Sorry. For, we received written comment, two written comments for this meeting. For the meeting, I apologize. Um, Ms. Stockwell is correcting me. For the meeting, we um, received two comments, but the comments that you'll receive on these rules on the language that we're proposing today will come during the secretary of state process as include to include a hearing as part of that MAPA process. So you will get those public comments and a summary of that hearing when we come back to you after these go through that process. Hey, Jody, does that help you? Yeah, thank you, um, Chairman Kippen. And, and also, I remember there was a bunch of public comment when this was um, in the House Bill 846 that we discussed previously. Okay. Um, so we'll need a motion on this. And with the um, additions in that uh, language change. Liz, can you do that for us? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I move the State Parks and Recreation Board instruct the department to file an administrative rule notice on behalf of the board, proposing establishment of the Smith River bonus point system for residents and non-residents with the additional language that was given to us at this meeting. That sounds good. Um, do I have a second there? Second. Okay, so Liz has had motion with the additions and uh, Jody has seconded that. And again, I'll ask, is there any uh, public commenters online? No, Mr. Chairman. Okay, then we will vote on it. Um, we'll start with District 1, Jody, yay or nay? Yay. Okay, Russ is a yay. Uh, District 3, Liz? Yes. And District 5, John? Yay. Yay. Okay, so that uh, passes four to zero. Um, that takes care of our action items. Um, do we have any public comment from items that are not on the agenda today? None, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so at this point, uh, call uh, someone to move to adjourn this meeting.
Mr. Chairman, I move to adjourn this meeting. Okay, John, a second. A second. And, okay, and uh, Beans, we, um, we'll just have to go um, call through again. I, did, I can't see you raise your hand on this one. Um, but uh, Jody, to adjourn? Yes. Russ, yes. Liz? Yes, and thanks to everybody. Okay. And John? Yes. All right. So this uh, meeting is now.